Hey guys, it's Karen. Welcome to Little Art Talks. Throughout this month, I've been sharing some of the greatest love stories of art history. Their sweet and passionate love stories, the drama and the affairs, but also what it's like to be artists, partners, and sometimes collaborators. What kind of art did they make and how is their art influenced by their partners? So if that sounds interesting to you, keep watching this video and also don't forget to subscribe. So far I've talked about couples where both people were artists. Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera were both artists, Marino Obanovich and Ulai were collaborators, but another very common relationship we see in art is the artist and his muse. Now when we talk about muses, there's no one quite as inspired by his beautiful women as Pablo Picasso. Now this is the guy who once said that love is the greatest refreshment in life and boy did he get his refreshments. Often multiple refreshments at the same time and he liked them extra fresh. This is a really bad joke, I apologize. Pablo Picasso hardly needs an introduction. The Spanish painter, sculptor, printmaker, ceramist, etc, etc is regarded as one of the greatest and most influential artists of the 20th century. While he was deemed a prodigy in his youth, he's also known for his ever-evolving style and innovation such as co-founding the Cubist movement. He's also very well known for his paintings of women, many of which are the most expensive paintings to ever have been sold. Today's video is all about Picasso's muses, who were these women and how they inspired art of Picasso throughout his career. In his lifetime, he was married twice and had four children with three different women. But he also had many, many affairs. And I'll warn you now, some of them, maybe a lot of them didn't end so happily ever after. I won't be sharing them all with you today because that would be ridiculous, but I am going to share um, a couple, maybe six or seven, it's kind of I didn't count beforehand. I will share the stories of seven of these women who are now immortalized in Picasso's work. Picasso showed an interest and skill for drawing at a young age. He was taught by his father, who was also an artist, and taught in the School of Fine Arts. The young Picasso received a traditional academic education in the arts, learning by copying the works of masters and drawing from plaster casts and live models. At just 13 years old, his father felt that his son had surpassed his own abilities and Pablo was accepted into an advanced class at the academy. Picasso traveled to the art capital Paris in the late 1890s, where he would be exposed to more modernist works and incorporated a symbolist influence in his practice. His early years in Paris were ones of extreme poverty. He shared a small room with his friend and even burned his work for warmth. This period is called the Blue Period, characterized, as suggested by the name, a predominantly blue or blue-green palette. Subjects include gaunt mothers with children, prostitutes and beggars. Blindness was a common theme during this time. The Rose Period, which followed, is more cheery in style and tone, with orange and pinks. The subjects also changed, many featuring circus people, acrobats, and harlequins. This period was influenced by his warm relationship with Fernand Olivia, a bohemian artist who became his model and mistress. She appears in many of his Rose Period paintings. Picasso began to find success as an artist by 1905 as a favorite among American art collectors Leo and Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein would become a principal patron of Picasso's, displaying his works in her informal salon in her Paris home. There, he met many artists like Henri Matisse and other collectors. He also joined an art gallery. Several of Picasso's early Cubist works, sometimes called Picasso's African period or proto-Cubism, were inspired by Olivier, such as Head of a Woman, and he even later admitted that one of the figures in his infamous Le Demoiselle d'Orient was modeled on her. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. After garnering some fame and fortune, Picasso began to lose interest in Olivier. She reminded him of the more difficult times. So of course he goes and has an affair. He began an affair with Marcel Ombre, whom he called Eva. Eventually, Fernand and Picasso separated in 1912, and Eva moved in with him. Twenty years after their relationship, 
Olivia wrote a memoir of their time together called Picasso and His Friends. In it, she describes how she was essential to him during these years of artistic and personal struggle, as they spent practically all their time together. She kept him company, was his lover, made the home, entertained their friends, and protected his privacy as they worked late into the night. But she also reveals the difficulty of living with the creative genius. His dark moods and jealousy would sometimes turn violent against her. Picasso and Eva headed for Avignon and met Georges Braque and his wife Marcel later that summer. It was during this time that Picasso developed Cubism with Braque. Picasso's Cubism is divided into two phases. The first is analytic Cubism. These works were often monochrome with brown neutral colors. Cubism is often described as objects being taken apart, a study of the shapes of objects. They portray the subject from multiple vantage points on one plane, allowing the viewer to, with one look, have a simultaneous impression of the object in a three-dimensional space. Picasso's time with Eva coincided with synthetic cubism, in which he worked with cubist collages and papier collé, incorporating cut paper fragments such as newspaper clippings. While Picasso never painted Eva, he would declare his love by including his nickname for her, Ma Jolie, which means my pretty one. Though they visited Picasso's family in Barcelona to discuss marriage, their relationship was cut short when she contracted tuberculosis or developed cancer and passed away. He was devastated by her premature death. After her death in 1915 to 1917 was Picasso's crystal period, or crystal cubism, in which his works were highly geometric and minimalist. Picasso continued to paint uninterrupted in Avignon despite the outbreak of World War I in 1914. Following the period of upheaval in World War I, a number of prominent European artists rejected the extreme avant-garde art and instead worked in a neoclassical style. This movement, called Return to Order, revived classicism and realistic painting and was evident in many of the works of the 1920s, including Picasso's. Perhaps influenced by his first trip to Italy in 1917, paintings and drawings of this period recall his earlier works in a classical style, as well as the works of Raphael and Ange, as seen in this portrait of Olga in an armchair. He met the Russian ballet dancer Olga Koklova while designing the costumes and set for a ballet that she danced in. She left the group to stay with Picasso in Barcelona, and the two moved to Paris, where they married in the summer of 1918. Koklova introduced Picasso to the life of the rich, high society, and formal dinner parties. The two had a son, Paolo Picasso. However, Koklova's taste clashed with Picasso's bohemian tendencies, and their relationship deteriorated from constant conflicts. He began a secret affair with 17-year-old Marie Thérèse Walter in 1927. She was heavily featured in his Vollard suite of etchings, a set of 100 etchings made in the neoclassical style. Koklova learned of the affair in 1935 when Walter became pregnant. Is anyone else impressed that Picasso had a secret affair that lasted for eight years? I, I feel like that's a long time to keep a secret. Koklova immediately took her son to the south of France and filed for divorce, but Picasso rejected it, unhappy with the fact that French law required them to have their belongings. So, Koklova remained his official wife until she died in 1955, while Te gave birth to their daughter Maya, and the two stayed with Picasso when Koklova left. Picasso's paintings of Walter, such as in Le Rêve, are often described as very sensuous. His relationship with the young blonde was probably very centered on their sexual relations. No surprise there, as images are almost melting with idyllic eroticism. Her calm, guiltless enjoyment of her own sensuality and the artist's complete satisfaction. It's often pointed out that Picasso has painted it appears, his own erect penis in the face of his model. 
However, Walter was ignorant of art and offered Picasso little on an intellectual level. His next muse was surrealist photographer Dora Maar, who both stimulated and challenged Picasso. Picasso called her his private muse. She spoke Picasso's native Spanish and shared his political concerns. While portraits of Walter were ones of satisfaction and brightness, Mars' images were dark and she often was painted in pain, such as in Weeping Woman. Mar was also Picasso's partner during a difficult time politically. Her inner turmoil in these images perhaps showed Payne's agony in the Civil War. Understandably, Watteau was pretty jealous when Picasso fell in love with Mar, and apparently the two accidentally met in Picasso's studio. While Picasso was working on Guernica, Mar was actually helping him out by documenting the process. She would photograph it in its various stages, and he would use it in his creative process. Anyways, the two accidentally met one day, and when they demanded that he choose between the two, he said he was just so happy with the current situation, he couldn't choose between the two, and if they made him choose, they would just have to fight it out amongst themselves. <sighs> and guess what? They actually began to wrestle. Oh my god. I don't even know if that's the worst part because later when Picasso is recounting like this memory, he called it one of his choicest memories. Hmm. He really enjoyed it, huh? Picasso supported Walter and Maya financially, but the two never married. During the Second World War, tensions mounted as Paris was occupied by the Nazis. Picasso's portraits of Mar became even more violently abstracted. He retreated into his work, continuing to paint and sculpt using smuggled bronze from the French Resistance. Picasso's art didn't fit the Nazi ideal of art, so he did not exhibit during this time and was often harassed by the Gestapo. One time while his apartment was being searched by the Gestapo, one of the officers stumbled across a photograph of Granica, and he asked, well, did you do this? And then Picasso famously replies, no, you did. That's pretty good, actually. After the liberation of Paris, Picasso grew tired of Mar, and he started a romantic relationship with a young art student named Françoise Gillot. They moved in together, and eventually they had two children, Claude and Paloma. During their 10 years together, spoiler, they didn't stay together, they didn't marry because he was already married to Olga and he was still married, but they did have a relationship that revolved around art. He painted La Femme Fleur when Matisse announced that he would create a portrait of Gillo, where her body would be pale blue and her hair would be leaf green. On the nature of her relationship, she later said in an interview, I could not say that it was a sentimental love. It was maybe an intellectual love or a physical love, but certainly not a sentimental love. It was love because we had good reason, each of us, to admire the other. This was the time of his greatest fame, living the millionaire life on the French Riviera, far removed from any external reality. As I mentioned, Picasso had many affairs with women, even ones with a greater age disparity than his and Gillot's. It's interesting to note that by his 70s, Picasso had created a number of paintings, ink drawings, and prints with the same theme, an old, grotesque dwarf as the doting lover of a beautiful young model. Gillo later wrote in her 1964 book, Life with Picasso, that his abusive treatment and his infidelities prompted her to leave him with their children in 1953. Picasso was very unhappy about that, and when she left, he told all art dealers he knew not to purchase her art. She instead married someone else in 1955. Remember Picasso's first wife, Olga Koklova, who he refused to divorce? Well, in 1955, she passes away, so now Picasso is free to remarry as he pleases. So he goes off to Gillo and says, Hey, 
Divorce your husband and marry me instead. That way our children, Claude and Paloma, will become my official heirs. So then she goes ahead and actually does it. She divorces her husband in 1962, expecting to marry Picasso so that their children would become his official heirs. But, huge but, he tricked her. He actually tricked her. Uh, because by then, he had already secretly married another woman, Jacqueline Roque, in 1962. 61 the year before so he was basically trying to get his revenge against her he was apparently still really mad that she left him and um yeah so they never married and he married another woman by the way he was also very angry when she published her book he did all sorts of things trying to stop its publication and when it was published he was so angry that he never spoke to Claude and Paloma again, and their relationship never healed from that. Even when he died, he passed away. His second wife prevented the children, Claude and Paloma, from attending his funeral. So their relationship is pretty bad. <laughs> so many things that make me so sad reading this. Uh, anyways, let's talk about the new wife, yeah? So who is the new wife? So Jacqueline Roque worked in the pottery studio where Picasso made and painted his ceramics. She was 27 and he was 72. Apparently, he romanced her by drawing a dove on her house in chalk and bringing her a rose every day until she agreed to date him. And that was six months later. They were married for 11 years before he passed away, and devastated by his death, she actually killed herself by gunshot in 1986. Picasso created more art based on Roque than any other woman. In one year, he painted over 70 portraits, and in their time together, he made over 400 portraits of the Demir Roque. In his final years, these images were the most tranquil, capturing her sharp features and almost classical stillness. That's a pretty sweet ending to this video, right? <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video on Pablo Picasso and his various muses. I also know that this video is late, but hopefully you can understand why. Originally, I was just going to do um, Picasso and Gilo. Also, sorry if all my French pronunciations are really bad. I, I know they're bad. Um, but just doing the script, I felt like I needed to tell the full story and I ended up with a total of seven. Originally, I was going for five, but then I was like, no, I need six. And then I was like, oh, I really want to include Eva as well. So I ended up with seven and this video turned out to be pretty long. There's a lot of them. There's so many women. Um, I've even made a chart of all of these women. This line up here is Picasso's life. These are the years. Just a handful of the women are the different colors. The, the squares are their time together. And then the lines are the woman's life, lifetime. So, um, look at that age difference right there. Impressive, isn't it? Anyways, I'll make a better chart and put it I'll post in our Facebook. Yeah, I should do that. Follow us on Facebook. Hopefully you can tell why it took a while to make this video and you enjoyed it. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, I really enjoy making these longer videos, but it's so time consuming and, you know, I need to pay for things and work. If you like these videos and you want to see more videos, please head on to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash littlearttalks. There you can make a monthly pledge or a one-time donation if that suits you. It really helps me justify spending all the time that I do writing, editing, and everything for these videos. Thank you so much if you are already a patron. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing and liking and commenting. <laughs> I'll see you guys all next time.